Welcome, everyone. Our first plenary speaker is the first Brazilian woman and the second woman in the world to receive the Ramanujan Prize. She is the vice president of the International Mathematical Union Committee for Women in Mathematics. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Carolina Araújo for IMPA, and she will talk about symmetries and algebraic geometry and Cremona transformation. Thank you, Carolina. Hello, Marcelo. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's uh, it's really an honor uh, to be here giving the, the first um, lecture of the, the workshop. I'm still very touched by the uh, by the opening ceremony and the opening video for the workshop. I wish I could be uh, physically close to all of you, but uh, this is a very uh, singular year, and I think we have to, um, to, to take the best out of it. So it's really a pleasure to be with uh, so many friends, uh, even if just uh, virtually. Okay. I think we have to share some slides with, with yes, us. Yes, let me uh, start sharing. OK. OK, I will put it in a full screen so that people can see it better. Uh, but let me just say, it. so I will not be, I, I will not be able to see the chat. So I, in, from time to time, I'll just okay. ask to make sure that uh, that you can still hear me. Okay. So let me just go on and put it in full screen. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you, even if remotely. And today I am going to tell you um, about symmetries in algebraic geometry and Cremona transformations. and. Um, and I think, I hope it will be clear later on in the talk, the importance of the study of singularities for the problem that I will be discussing. So let me start by introducing uh, symmetries. So in, in, in any area of mathematics and special in geometry, uh, when someone is studying a geometrical or a mathematical objects, it's often very important to understand its symmetries. So in geometry, I, I have um, I have I've put here two pictures that uh, of, of varieties that admit symmetries, and so that we can sort of start getting a feeling of what this means. So in our so I will I will uh, introduce the what I mean precisely by symmetry very soon. Uh, but in our context, we will be working with uh, complex a complex algebraic varieties, and in this case, um, the by asymmetry, the first notion that I want to to introduce is the notion of the of automorphism. So, given any complex projective variety, we can consider its group of automorphisms, and that is uh, encoding its uh, symmetries. And it turns out, so for instance, when X is the projective space, the automorphisms is just the group of uh, linear projective transformations of Pn. So this is PGL n plus one C. And this is a this is a lead group that we understand very well. In general, what I want to explain now is that the structure of the automorphism group, the 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 structure of the group reflects prop geometric properties of the ambient variety. So, um, so let me just fix notation. So we start with a, with a complex projective variety. Then uh, the automorphism group is in fact a Lie group, and we can look at the connected component of the identity. So this connected component of the, the identity is a complex algebraic group, and and the um, and the quotient is a countable discrete group. So let's look at some uh, specific, some, some examples of these groups. So let's start in the simplest case, which is the case of a smooth projective curve of genus G. So we know that this, there is this well-known trichotomy uh, between uh, uh, of, of smooth projective curves of, or, or Riemann surfaces, which is the genus zero, genus one, and genus greater or equal than two. 
and they have different behaviors from many points of view. And this is also reflected in the automorphism group. So when the genus is zero, so this is just, uh, this curve is just P1, and we know that the automorphism group is just PGL2C. So this is a, um, in, in particular, it is an affine variety. For the genus one case, then uh, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the connected component of the identity is isomorphic to the, to the curve X itself. So X is an elliptic curve. It admits a structure of uh, uh, a group structure, and uh, and the out and the con the, uh, <clears throat> the connected component of the identity is just isomorphic to X itself. I want to point out a difference between the first case. So the in, in, even though in both cases we have a, a positive dimensional complex algebraic group. Uh, the first one is an affine variety, where the second one is a projective variety. And then the discrete part will depend on the curve, but it's always uh, finite. Okay, and the next case, when the genus is at most, uh, is at least two, then the automorphism group is a, is a finite group. Okay, so this is, we have that we see the three different behaves here and that actually extends to higher dimensions. But now what I would like to convey next is that even though of course the study of the automorphism group of a variety is, uh, is very important and has uh, many applications, from the point of view of birational geometry, the notion of automorphism is too rigid and we need to make more flexible our notion of symmetry. Okay, so let me ask uh, Marcelo if uh, you can still hear me. Yes, it's it's okay. It's nice. Okay, okay. Thank you, Marcelo. Okay, okay so now let me then um, recall some some results from birational geometry, and uh, and and so for that, let me describe the classification problem in algebraic geometry. So the in in, in dimension one. The classification is exactly the one that I gave you. We have a, a discrete invariant, the genus, that that roughly classifies the um, curves of degree of, of genus G. And then once you fix uh, once you fix the genus, there is a modulized space of curves of genus G. So we have a discrete classification, and then we have a, a modulized space um, for for curves and with the same invariants. In higher dimensions, such a, such a classification is not possible, basically because there are too many isomorphism classes. And this is very well illustrated by the blow up. So let me recall you the blow up. So here I illustrated the blow up of the projective plane at one point. So we know very well that uh, outside, so I'm calling X tilde this blow up, and if I outside and I replace the I replace the point P that I blow up by the P1 of uh, tangent directions at that point, and if I remove this exceptional divisor, this exceptional P1, and the point that I blow up, then I get isomorphic open subsets. And then I can keep blowing up more points, and in this way I can produce an uncountable set of non-isomorphic. Um, surfaces, even though they are very similar, they have uh, an open subset that is isomorphic to each other. Okay, so in general, more generally, I can blow up, I can start with any, say, smooth projective variety X and, and blow up any proper subvariety Z. Uh, and if they are both smooth, then, then the resulting variety is again a smooth projective variety. And I, if I remove the center of the blow up and its inverse image, which we call the exceptional divisor, then again, I get an isomorphism between the variety X and its blow up. And in this way, I can produce many, many, um, many varieties that somehow look like X, um, but they're non-isomorphic. Okay, so the so the classification problem in higher dimensions is uh, slightly different. So what we do is, so first let me define uh, a more flexible notion, of, uh, more flexible equivalence relation among varieties that's more flexible than being um, 
isomorphic, which is the notion of birational equivalence. So I recall that two uh, projective varieties, X and Y, are, are said to be birationally equivalent if they have uh, isomorphic dense open subsets U and V. And this is, uh, so this is, this, this notion is usually, uh, you, you will usually note in this way, you know, by a dashed, uh, dashed arrow. Now, uh, this definition can be, uh, can be equivalently stated as in terms of uh, algebra in this way. So th to say that the two varieties are birationally equivalent is the same thing as saying that their uh, field of, uh, of functions are isomorphics as extensions, field extensions of the of the field of complex numbers. So this is these are two equivalent definitions for uh, birational equivalence. And then now in higher dimensions, the problem of birational cl classification can be uh, can be summarized as follows. So there are two steps. So the first step is given a projective variety, we would like to find a simplest representative in its birational class. So we usually call uh, this a minimal model of X. And then we want to construct modelized spaces of minimal models once we fix some that discrete invariance. So these are the two main steps of the, classifi the, the, the birational classification problem. And I will now concentrate on the first problem, the problem of finding a minimal model in a given birational class. Okay, so this uh, so this is this this is the is the is the goal of the so-called minimal model program, which is a um, <clears throat> very important and central central theme in in algebraic geometry. So we want to, given a projective variety, find a simplest representative in its birational class. This is what we call the minimal model. And, and uh, now we know that this is, uh, this is possible. So in dimension one, this was, this was just the work of Riemann on classification of Riemann surfaces in the 19th century. In dimension two, this was achieved by this Italian school in the earlier 20th century. Uh, in higher dimensions, then um, some new dif difficulties and, and, and new ingredients uh, come in. And so the problem is much harder and it was achieved by Mori in, well, we actually, this was a consequence of work of many people, but um, let me just uh, um, <clears throat> give the credit here to, to Mori who finished the program in 1999 and uh, in, sorry, in 1988. And in higher dimensions, this, uh, this is a very uh, recent um, achievement by Birkar, Kashini, Haken, McCurran. So now we know, uh, how to find uh, minimal models for uh, for projective varieties. And now once we have the minimal model program and we can understand the minimal model in a, in a birational, or we can reach a minimal model uh, in, a, in the birational class of any given uh, rational uh, um, algebraic variety, then we may be interested in the studying in more details um, varieties in some specific special birational class. And I think the, the simplest um, projective variety that one can think of is the projective space. And now we want to understand which varieties are birationally equivalent to the projective space. So this is, uh, this is my next definition. So we say that a variety is rational if it is birationally equivalent to the projective space or equivalently if, if its uh, function field is uh, isomorphic as, an, as, a, an, as a, an extension of C to the function field of Pn. So this is the, the function field in, in N variables. And so one, uh, one very, uh, one central problem in birational geometry is to understand which algebraic varieties are rational. And let me, um, let me, be more even more concrete and let me ask you the following question so now let's look at hypersurfaces so somehow these are simplest uh, to describe and so we want to know for which degree d 
and dimension n is the generic hypersurface XD uh, rational. So this is for, for a small, let's look at for the smallest value of D for D equals to two. This is, uh, this is very simple and, and, and to answer. So this is uh, the quadric hypersurface in Pn plus one. In this case, we can perform this stereographic projection from, from a point, and this induces this. It's easy to see that this defines a birational map between the quadric hypersurface and, and Pn. But now the next for the next degree, the degree d equals three, the problem is already open for dimensions at least four. So the problem, a problem that it's uh, it's been calling um, a lot of attention recently, uh, but still very much open, is if is the generic cubic hypersurface rational for n greater than three? So for n equals to two, so we know that the rational, a cubic uh, surface is rational. It's uh, isomorphic to the blow up of P2 at six general points. Uh, in dimension three, we know that the, the cubic uh, threefold is not rational. This is the work of Clement and Griffiths. And already in dimension four, we do not know the answer. And, and so this is very, I find this very striking. And if you want to approach such a problem to understand the, the, the rationality, the first thing that one needs is uh, to know some birational invariants in order to compare them with, uh, with PN. And for this purpose, so which properties are invariant under birational equivalence? And, and now it now I, I, I will explain why the notion of symmetry that we started with, namely that of an automorphism, is not good for these purposes. So notice that the group of automorphism is not a birational invariant. And this is, I'm illustrating this in this diagram. So we have here, um, we have here, um, so we start with an isomorph, with an automorphism of X, and let's assume that we have another projective variety, Y, that is birationally equivalent to X. Now, the automorphism of X will induce a birational self-map of Y, which in general is not going to be an isomorphism of Y. And this is why the automorphism group is not a birational invariant. And so now we are led to consider a more, this more flexible notion of symmetry, which is more suitable for birational problems, which is the birational group of a variety. So if we start with a variety X, we can consider the birational self maps of X and they form a group uh, under composition. So, this is, and the Cremona group is exactly the Cremona group of Pn. So this is the Cremona group in dimension n. And uh, let's, I will discuss now briefly this group. So first of all, of course, it contains the group of automorphisms of Pn, Pgl n plus one, but it has many more elements. So the, the simplest one and probably most famous one, which you may have seen is the, uh, standard quadratic transformation. So this is uh, defined by inverting the, the projective coordinates, or if, you know, if we multiply um, one over X, one over Y, and one over Z by X, Y, Z, then we get this, uh, this quadratic description of this map. So this is why we call it the quadratic, the standard quadratic transformation. So we notice that uh, if you remove the, so let me draw a picture here. So if you remove the three coordinate axes, then this becomes an isomorph an isomorphism of the open subset of the complement of the three coordinate axes. And on the other hand, we see that each of the coordinate axes is uh, is contracted to uh, to the opposite point. So we see that this is really not an isomorphism, but rather a um, a birational self map. And let me just point out that if you give me any degree D, I can construct a birational self map of P2 or more generally of uh, Pn um, given by homogeneous polynomials of this same degree D without common um, 
factors. So there are plenty of uh, Cremona transformations of arbitrarily large degree. So it may come as a surprise, but okay, this is by now a classical result, uh, the, known as the theorem of Neder Castel Novo, that the, the Cremona group in dimension two is generated by the automorphism groups of P2 together with the standard quadratic transformation. So this is a, this is a classical result. It was first stated by Nether. Uh, there, was, um, there was a gap in the proof of Nether and the, the first complete proof was given by uh, Castel Novo in 1901. So this, is, uh, this, is, this can be striking because as I said before, there are uh, Cremona transformations of P2 of any given degree while it is as a group is generated by the automorphism. So these are um, linear, uh, linear maps and this quadratic map. And also uh, going back to the rationality problem that I stated, I want to, I would like to say that uh, this really, this is, a, is really an important birational invariant. So for instance, um, the work of Skovsky in, in Manin in the in the late in the 70s they show that the um the quartic threefold is not rational by analyzing the the group of birational self maps of the uh quartic threefold and showing that it is different than the group of birational self maps of p3 okay so uh let me say a few more words and state a few more results in the, about the Cremona group in dimension two. So in addition to the Nutter Castelnovo theorem, which was proved more than a hundred years ago, um, there are, um, we have now um, many results about the Cremona group uh, that even though this, this so what I want to say is that even though we have this very simple descript description in terms of generators, the, automor the PGL3, plus this one quadratic transformation, the structure of this group is very complicated. And only recently um, we have learned some important and, and, and important properties of this group. So for instance, only uh, some 10 years ago, uh, we, we had an answer to a very natural question uh, namely simplicity of the group. So Cantin Lamy proved that the, the Cremona group in dimension two is not a simple group. And also the question of classification of finite subgroups was only uh, finished recently. So it's this started by in the work of Bertini in the, in the 19th century and only very recently uh, with the work of Dolgoshev and Skovsky, um, we, we now have a complete classification of finite subgroups of uh, P2. Okay, so now I want to move to Cremona groups in higher dimensions. So before I go on, let me ask Marcelo if um, if you can if you can still hear me. Hello. Okay, it's it's everything is okay. Uh, okay. Carol. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Marcelo. Okay, so now I would like to uh, compare the nether Casanova theorem that we have in, in, in dimension two to what happens in higher dimension. So the situation now becomes very different. So it is, uh, it is known from the, since the work of, of Ilda Hudson in 1927 that for dimensions at least three, the uh, Cremona group in dimension N cannot be generated by elements of bounded degree. So any set of generators will have to include arbitrarily large degree elements. So this is uh, very much in contrast with the, the, the dimension two case. And, and, and we do not have, and we do not know any, um, any nice set of generators. So one problem to, to try to understand this group is to construct interesting subgroups of the Cremona group. So by interesting, I mean interesting in two ways. So first of all, this, this subgroup should have some interesting geometric significance. 
And at the same time, this, this subgroup should have uh, an easy description, for instance, in terms of generators. So let me give you an example of such subgroup still in dimension two. So we could fix, say, a meromorphic volume form on P2. So this is dx over x, wedge dy over y. So this is a, a meromorphic volume form having simple poles along the triangle. So by the triangle, I mean the three coordinate axes. So um, this group is called the symplectic, the group of symplectic birational transformations of P2. And it was studied by Blank who gave a very nice description in terms of generators. So the, the, the group of um, birational self-maps of P2 that preserve this meromorphic volume form is generated by, well, so first we have um, the C star, the, the torus, C star squared, and SL2Z. So this part is uh, the part that preserves the, the torus. And let me just describe the action of SL2Z uh, as a Cremona transformation. So this is given by the monomial transformations uh, in this way. And so this first part is the part that preserved the torus and, and it's somewhat well understood. And then there is one more generator, which is this, uh, this, this Cremona transformation that I write on the on the right that has order five, and it's actually in very interesting. This Cremona transformation appears in 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 many different different places, and and it is the the remaining the the generator that you need to, together with the torus invariant part to uh, to generate this group. And uh, let me say that also Blanc obtained some of the relations among the, the generators, but not, not all the, the relations are known. Okay, so now uh, we would like, one thing that we would like to do is to uh, generalize this theorem to higher dimensions. Can we determine the, uh, the, the subgroup of the Cremona group consisting of birational self maps that preserve the natural volume form uh, on the torus. So this is uh, this is the question. We do not know the answer to this, but what I would like to explain to you next is um, is what some tools from from birational geometry and the minimal model program that can be used to approach this problem. So before I discuss this problem, let me generalize it. Um, to other, uh, to, to be able to construct other subgroups of the Cremona group of Pn. So if you, if if we take any meromorphic volume for omega, we can look at the biration, the, the subgroup consistent of uh, birational self maps of Pn that preserve this meromorphic volume form. So let me remind you that in in cohomology we can look at the, the the divisor associated to the class of a divisor associated to to omega. So this would be the uh, divisor of zeros minus the divisor of poles. And this is always in in cohomology or in the Picard group. This is all always equivalent to minus n plus one times a hyperplane section. This is precisely the canonical class of the projective space. Now, uh, a remark that conversely, if you give me any hypersurface in Pn of degree n plus one, then there is a unique up to scaling meromorphic volume for omega d, such that uh, whose, whose divisor is precisely minus, um, minus, uh, minus d. So d is the divisor of poles of this meromorphic uh, volume form and there is no um, there is no zero this this uh, this volume form has no zeros in co-dimension one so we if by abuse of notation we will denote by uh, beer PND to be the group of uh, self maps of PN that preserve the corresponding volume form and in some cases as we will see soon this will be 
precisely the birational self-maps of Pn that induce a birational self-map of D. So in, in, in when the singularities are not too bad, this is uh, these are the same, this is the same concept. And now the more general problem that we want to consider is to determine the group of birational self-maps of Pn uh, that preserve the, the, the volume form associated to D. Okay, so this is the problem that, um, that we have been looking at in, in collaboration with Alessio Corti and Alex Massarenti. So let me, um, so the philosophy that I want to explain here is that this group um, will be very dull if D is, is generic, if it is not special. And it will be very interesting uh, when D starts to acquire uh, interesting singularities. Okay, so to state this, let me state our first theorem. So we what we first we we start by proving, uh, as I said, that if the D is uh, very general, and by that I mean if it is smooth and is it satisfies the the Lefschetz principle, the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem. So the 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 um, <clears throat> the H2 of DZ is just restriction of the hyperplane class or the Picard number, the Picard group of D is obtaining by restricting uh, hyperplane classes in um, from the ambient space. In this case, there is not really any interesting uh, Cremona transformation uh, preserving the, the volume form associated to D and these this group is just the group of automorphisms of Pn that fix uh, the divisor D. So not, not very interesting. On the other hand, let's look at the other extreme. What if we take D very degenerate? So the most degenerate uh, situation that we can think of is when D is n plus one times a hyperplane section. Um, Sorry, here should be uh, the d should be n plus one times uh, times h. So this would be uh, so this this group, the group of birational self maps preserving the uh, this this volume form contains as a subgroup the group of automorphisms of a n, which we know that this is a very complicated very complicated group, uh, very with a very rich uh, stru structure. And, uh, and so, in, in fact, in this uh, super degenerate case, I don't, we don't have technique. The techniques from the minimum model program will not be applied, at least as, as far as we know so far, uh, to such degenerate examples. So the trick is to look to something in between. And the philosophy is that if the singularities of D are mild, then we can use techniques from the minimum model program to determine this subgroup of the Cremona group. And by mild, for those that, that, uh, that are familiar with the singularities of the minimal model program, what I mean is that if the pair Pn comma D has log canonical singularities, then we have a very strong tool from the minimal model program that we can uh, apply in this case. And if the uh, singularities of the pair are just canonical, then we are in a very good shape and the tools work especially um, smoothly, as, as I will explain next. So let's look at uh, a very specific example. So I start in, I, in, with a general quartic hypersurface in P3 having one singular point so this is the, so if I assume that the coordinates of this point is one, zero, zero, zero. So this is the generic equation of such a quartic hypersurface. And the singularity at the point P looks like the singularity of a quadric cone as drawn in this picture. So in fact, this green cone is precisely the tangent cone to the uh, to the hypersurface at the point P, which is given by the, uh, the polynomial H2, X1, X2, X3. 
So this is the uh, this is the tangent cone, and this is how the singularity looks like at the origin. In this case, um, it's it's easy to check that this is an example of a uh, canonical singularity. And in this case, as I said, the group of birational self-maps of P3 that preserve the form coincide with the group of birational transformations of P3 that induce a autom or an, a birational self-map of D. And in this case, as I, this is just to show you that we do have uh, non-trivial elements in this group. So I just wrote down explicitly a Cremona transformation, and now you will have to believe me that if you plug in um, the, the equation of D, you will see that it is preserved under this birational map. So this is an example of um, a, a birational self-map of P3 that preserves D or preserves the form, the, the, the um, meromorphic form associated to D. And moreover, from this equation, if you compute, you will see that this is an involution. So this is this square is the identity. So we get this subgroup of this uh, of the birational group, group of P3 preserving D. Okay, so this is an example to show that there is there are interesting things in this group. And uh, our so this is what I just said before, and our second theorem says that in this case we can completely describe the structure of this group. It has a structure of a semi-direct product of uh, well, so there is this G that I'm going to describe later, and this uh, Z mod two Z, and this Z mod two Z is precisely the one that appears in this in the example. This can be taken to be this. Uh, um, <clears throat> this order two subgroup. And the G, I will explain later, this is a form of GM over uh, the function field CXY, the function field of, uh, of the plane. So by what, what do I mean by a form of GM over this field? So what I mean is that this G is an algebraic group defined over this field, the field of functions of the plane. And after a change of coordinates, after a base change, it becomes uh, it, it becomes a, the group GM. So after a quadratic, in fact, a quadratic base change, it will uh, become isomorphic to GM. So I will explain how this group um, how how we how this group appears in the proof but let me just before let me just say that if you are interested in explicit cremona transformations this theorem can be made um, very concrete we can write down explicitly all the elements in this group so for instance the elements in the in the in this subgroup g in the subgroup g this normal subgroup g um, can be written in this way where F and G are homogeneous polynomials uh, satisfying this degree condition, or uh, you can also take um, a G to be to be a constant and F to be zero. That also that also works. Okay, so now let me explain to you uh, how we prove this theorem. Okay, so first of all. Uh, let let me let's understand what happens when we blow up P3 at the singular point of the hypersurface. So if we blow up uh, P3 at the singular point, then we had a surface with a with a, a rational double point at P, and then when we blow up, we desingularize it. So now this we get this D prime, this sorry this D tilde. The, the, the blow up of the of the surface. This is now a smooth K3 surface. And if we consider the projection from the point P, then that will induce on D tilde um, a double cover of P2. So X, the blow up of P3, has a structure of a P1 bundle 
over P2. So this is just induced by the projection from P. And the blown up surface, D tilde, is a two to one cover of P2. Okay, so this is the first thing that we have to observe. And let me just point out that we this we, we know very well the geometry of this K3 surface D tilde and under and, and knowing it is, is fundamental to prove the, the theorem. But now let me just say I will put in I'm writing in pink uh, the main step of the proof. So the main step of the proof is the following. So we we, we show that given any birational self-map of P3 that preserves D, uh, Psi, it can be fit in the following commutative diagram. So we blow up, if we blow up the point uh, P, then it will uh, factor in this way. So what this is telling us, this diagram is telling us is that any birational self-map of P3 that preserves D has to preserve the, um, the star of lines through P. So we, it takes uh, the lines through P to lines through P up to uh, a small set of lines. So this is what this diagram is telling us. And proving that we always have a factorization in this way is what allows us to prove the theorem. So this is the main step. And let's see how we uh, prove our theorem from this, uh, from this factorization result. Well, now, it, from, from this diagram, we see that the birational the group of birational self-maps of P3 preserving D can be seen as the group of birational self-maps of X over P2 fixing D tilde. Now, um, if we view X as a model of P1 over the function field of P2, so we are viewing X as a P1 uh, as a model of P1 over this function field, then uh, this D tilde, so this D tilde maps two to one to P2. So what we have is this um, is this exact sequence. So we can, given a birational self map, it fixes D tilde, and because D tilde maps two to one to P2, it either uh, fixes the tilde pointwise, or it performs the involution corresponding to the two to one cover. And so this is the quotient onto the, the cyclic group of order two. And let me, uh, and let me also observe that the sequence splits and the splitting is exactly given by that, given by that example that I, I explained to you in the beginning that, that, explicit um, non-trivial birational self-map is what makes this, uh, this sequence split. And now let's look at the kernel G. Now the kernel then will correspond to birational self-maps of X that fix D tilde um, pointwise. Now D tilde maps two to one in over P2. And so if we perform a base change, it becomes um, so if we perform a base change by D tilde, it becomes um, a birational self-map of this P1 bundle having two of, sorry, of this P1 over the function field of the surface um, fixing two points. Now, automorphisms of P2, P1 that fix two points is precisely GM. So this is how we see that G is a form of GM over um, over the function field uh, of the plane. Okay, so now let me move on to discuss how we factorize a birational self-map of Pn. And now this is an old story. So for any birational self-map of Pn, we have what is called the Sarkeesov program. So this was proved by Corti. Uh, following the ideas of Sarkisov in 1995 in dimension three and generalized to arbitrary dimension by Haken and McKernan in 2013. So what they prove is the following. Any, well, the, the, the statement is more general. It's, uh, it applies to more generally to what we call more fiber spaces, but let's just um, 
um, restrict to the situation of Pn. So any birational self-map of Pn, Psi, can be decomposed as what we call elementary links. So these Xi's that appear in, in, uh, in between, the varieties that appear, these are rational varieties, but they are more than that, they are special uh, rational varieties. They are Mori fiber spaces. And the Mori fiber spaces are precisely the possible outcomes. In this case, these are the possible outcomes of the MMP when you apply it to a rational variety. And the psi i are elementary links. I do not want to define them, but it's um, there. These are rational maps that are very easy to describe. And if we understand this well, then you understand all the birational self maps of P n. Well, modulo actually making this um, making this factorization concrete, which is which is not an easy task. But theoretically, it's, this is a very nice uh, framework. To, to study these maps. And more recently, so this is this is holds for any birational self-map, but more recently we have this theorem by Corti and Carlo Giros from 2016 that says that any volume-preserving birational map is a composition of volume-preserving circuits of links. So we can uh, we can make this definition precise, more precise. I do not want to do it uh, here, but roughly what it says is that we can uh, we can in include divisors uh, in each of our models Xi uh, such that the pair has uh, mild singularities and the birational maps are volume preserving. So we, we apply this theorem in our situation. So in our situation, let me recall our theorem B. If we have D, a general quartic hypersurface with one singular point P, then we want to understand this group of birational self-maps. And if we apply uh, the volume-preserving Sarkeesov program, we give, starting with any volume-preserving birational self-map of P3, so this is psi, we analyze what are the possible uh, Sarkis of decompositions, and we show that the first and the last step of the Sarkis of decomposition is precisely the blow up of P3 at the point P. So this is this is not difficult to, to show uh, using the techniques for the minimal model program and, <clears throat> and the description of what we call divisorial contractions. And then moreover, when we look at the middle part, we also show that this preserves the uh, the element all the elementary links that appear will preserve the um, the P1 bundle structure to P2. And to show that this is a this is a mixture of the understanding what are the circuits of links and making them concrete, and also checking them, comparing them with the geometry of the D tilde, which, which is a smooth K3 surface. So we have to understand well the surface and each link will restrict to a certain um, birational map on, on the surface, D tilde, and, and knowing the geometry of the surface, we will have enough restrictions uh, to prove a theorem like this. So this is the proof of our, how, I, the idea of the proof of our theorem B. And uh, let me just finish by saying that we also, uh, we have a, a third theorem that I have not uh, described where we consider, uh, again, quartic hypersurfaces, but now having a singularity of type A2 at the point P. So this, this general case is a singularity of type A1, and then we get a singularity of type A2, and now the, uh, the birational geometry of the pair becomes much more, much more involved. It's actually, uh, we were actually surprised to see how rich um, the, 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 geometry, the birational geometry of the pair becomes. And we do not yet have uh, a description of the group, but we, are, we have a description of all the Sarkis of links and, the, and, of, uh, and all the Mori fiber spaces that will appear in, a, in such a decomposition. Okay, so this is what I wanted to, to tell you today. And 
I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you, Carolina. Any questions, comments, or remarks we can put in the in the chat? Carolina, is also to split the, the birational, the Cremona group, and we obtain a subgroup, a symmetric subgroup? Sorry, you mean he, here in this theorem? Yeah, uh, no, in general, for instance. Ah, we, okay, in general, this is, so you want to construct quotients of the birational... Yeah. Yeah, so this is a this is a very exciting uh, recent results. So there are mm. people that are studying the that are studying uh, the Cremona group in general, not this volume preserving subgroups, and uh, so they, they there are they construct very interesting quotients of the birational subgroup of uh, of the Cremona group in dimensions at least three. Um, they construct. Uh, they construct quotients onto onto finite groups like this. So this is done in dimension at least three. In dimension two, this is not possible. Uh, we cannot have a finite portion of the Cremona group in the plane, but in higher dimension, um, they have been constructing using precisely this tool of the Sarkisov program. So this is, uh, so this is, well, I, roughly speaking, the, the, the only tool that we have in, in arbitrary dimension. Oh, okay, okay. So, any questions or comments? Let me see in the chat one moment. Okay. So, Carolina, on behalf of the audience, I'd like to, to thank you, okay? Thank you, Marcelo. Okay. And I hope to see all of you in the coffee break. Uh, yes, very yes. soon. <laughs> So I'd like to invite everyone to the web coffee now, okay? And I think the next uh, plenary talk uh, will be at 22.12, okay? See you there. Thank you again, Carolina. Thank you, Marcelo.
Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it is a great pleasure to me to announce our next speaker. It is Terry Gaffney from Northeastern University. Uh, he is going to talk about eco-singularity and non-isolated singularities. So, Professor, thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction, Tiago. Uh, greetings from Boston. <laughs> Getting here, but I'm sure it's sunny in San Carlos. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this, the 16th workshop in, uh, in Singularities. Uh, it was great to be there at the beginning of the, of the thing and uh, wish us many more years together. So the title of my talk, as uh, Tiago said, is uh, Eco Singularity and Non-Isolated Singularities. But uh, before I, I start, I want to fix some notation, and that's on the blackboard over here. So I'm going to be working in the complex analytic setting. Uh, I'll be working with families of sets. Families of sets will be over a smooth base. And our family is going to be contained in, in uh, CN cross Y. X itself is in CN. And now we have uh, the notation I use for the, the map that defines family and defines each of the sets in the family. X naught is going to denote the smooth part of X. And the ideal that defines uh, y, which we'll be using in some cases, is uh, of course just given by the coordinates in the ambient space, the zi. Now, one of the main actors in our, our, our theory is the Jacobian module of the family, or the Jacobian module of x, if x is just a single space, and the relative Jacobian module, these are defined by the appropriate partial derivatives. If, uh, if I have a submodule of a free module, then I can talk about its integral closure, which I've been over the bar. Throughout the talk, we assume that X and the fibers in our family are equidimensional. If, uh, now, sometimes I'm going to have the, have the situation, in fact, when I think about it with singularity problems, I always have this. I'll have a section going backwards. And if, if y is embedded in x as 0 cross ck, we say that x is a, a family with a section. So now I can start talking about the problem that I'm interested in, in working on here. If I have a family with section, then I say that the family is a Whitney Echo singular family, which I abbreviate by WE. If X has a stratification, with, with Y as a stratum. Okay, so here's, here's the problem that has consumed me for the last 30 years. We want to find invariance of our family such that these invariants being independent of y is a necessary and sufficient condition for the family to be Whitney echo singular. Well, to approach Whitney echo singularity, we find it very helpful to have uh, some infinitesimal objects which are sort of capturing the failure of Whitney echo singularity. And the first uh, theorem I proved along these lines was in 93, and that is that if, uh, if the smooth part of X and Y, well, they will satisfy W if and only if these partial derivatives of F with respect to the family variables are contained in the integral closure of the maximal ideal, of the ideal that defines Y times the Jacobian module. And then we have the same thing holding true we only use the, the relative uh, module. So this is our first link. We have a way of going from our conditions, our echo singularity conditions, to an infinitesimal condition, which we can try to show holds. All right, what do we do?
We need a link between the theory of integral closure and the theory of invariance of modules. The link between these two ideas is provided by the polar multiplicities of a module. Maybe I should say instead of multiplicities, let's be more general. Let's increase the polar varieties of a module. Details and how to define these polar varieties of a module are contained in um, back, a, back, a background paper I wrote for the Salvador proceedings, and I encourage you to look at that if you what, if you don't remember the details. But I'm mostly going to be interested in the polar variety. Of M of four dimension D. So here again I have X, the family, over YK, so the fiber has dimension D, and we want, we will, we will use the polar variety of co dimension D of the Jacobian module, the relative Jacobian module of uh, that. The usefulness of this idea comes from a new problem and a link between the new problem and the old problem. So we want to find an invariant of the fibers call it E such that E is independent of Y if and only if Whole variety of co dimension D of the Jacobian module of C of M is empty. And the reason that we are interested in problem two is because using the background theory on polar varieties in integral closure, we can show that a solution to problem two implies a solution to problem one. So it's enough, it turns out to be enough just to control the, this particular polar variety. And we, once we've done that, then we have another list of invariants which you understand very well, and all those invariants together take care of the problem. All right. So I want to talk about a solution to problem two, because the elements in this solution problem two are the elements we want to use in making constructions to do more cases and they certainly should be elements of the general solution as well.
Okay. So I want to talk about a solution to problem two. And the case that I'm going to talk about is that of essentially isolated determinantal singularities. I'll, I will define these in a minute. This is uh, what I'm reporting on here is joint work with with Maria Ruas. And it, uh, it appears in the archive. So oh, it's not so hard to find. So of course, whenever I start a new case, I have to start with some notation. So here we go. So I'm going to be looking at maps from CQ0 into um, n, n plus k. Here, of course, the space has the space has a very nice stratification given by the rank of the matrices. And if I take the closure of one of those up and let that by Say, okay, and following the notation of the literature, this is going to consist of all elements of this Hom space. Where the rank of M is less than K. And uh, some occasionally it'd be useful to refer to the map that defines this. So this is going to be, I'll call it the defining map to K. And then F, which is going to define my essentially isolated singularity back here in CQ, is going to be equal to G composed with P. And F inverse is zero, put it up by sigma k. Because it comes from phi. And then the definition is that phi sigma k of phi is an EIDS. And phi is transverse. to the SI for all I less than K, except perhaps at the origin. So this is my notation for determinal singularities. I want to talk about how the about the elements in the solution. The problem two.
So the underlying idea of this first part is that instead of looking at an isolated family of determinental singularities, let's look at the place where all families of determinal singularities come from. And if we're doing that, then let's think about what the generic member of a generic family would be. And so to do that, we use the uh, following idea. We say that P is a capital P is a stabilization of P. If uh, P is a deformation, one for every deformation. Such that if I take P and fix S, then uh, this is going to be transverse to the SR. Transverse to. DSR for R and less than or equal to T minus one. Here I'm investigating uh, something that maybe the paper I should use to see. And then we call sigma T of uh, ES. We say it's a is an essential smoothing. So this is an essential smoothing of uh, of the that I started with. And then we can make the definition that gives us the invariant that we're going to need to control the all the varieties of the correct co-dimension in the, in the total family. This is the degree over C of the polar of co-dimension D of the relative Jacobian module, which I get when I compose GT composed with B. Then the uh, proposition is that, well, okay, suppose the T of P is in the IDS. If it's an EIDS, then the, the invariant that I need which I'm about to write down is the uh, following. So if I write down, I'll denote this by ED of sigma T of V. And by definition, it's equal to the multiplicity of the pair of modules, the Jacobian module of sigma T of V, which is the main object I'm interested in. And then the other
So uh, my main variant that is um, is well defined. And then the second point. allows us to get our hands on MD. So MD of sigma T of phi is equal to this number I've just defined, the multiplicity of the pair. Plus the image of phi intersected with the polar of co-dimension D Sigma T. Well, this might be hard to calculate in practice, but this is just the multiplicity of a pair of modules, and so it's just a computer algebra. And uh, this term here is interesting because it suggests that what you want to do is get your hands on the whole varieties of your universal object, which is really my universal object. Minus polar varieties, and then the, the extra term you need is just done as an intersection number, which you can try to calculate using intersection theory. And uh, this uh, this was in fact uh, successfully calculated in terms of C in a paper that my student Tony Rangichev and I did together, which is also on the archive. It was done in the case where T is equal to to n, the maximum possible, still open in other other dimensions. So let me just say a little bit about the proof of this. And again, all the details are contained in the paper on the archive. So you first need a lemma with our first point is, well, let's see, we have a chat two parts here. First part is that uh, we have a lemma which appears in that paper, which says that V is transverse to SI uh, then uh, at phi of x, x not equal to zero, that implies that the Jacobian module uh, pullback, if you take its interval closure, it's equal to the pullback of the whole Jacobian module in singularity. And then, since uh, oh, star, since star holds except at zero, then we know that the multiplicity of the pair. The multiplicity of the pair measures the difference between the small module, which in this case is the Jacobian module of sigma t, and the bigger module. And as long as the integral closures agree except at the origin, it's going to give us a well defined number. The second part is more technical, and this involves the uh, proof of uh, the proof of two. It uses the multiplicity polar theorem, and I don't have time to talk about that today. And 
then the theorem is that MD of uh, sigma T of B of Y independent of Y And this is true if and only if the polar variety of uh, J um, X so. so this invariant, which we can express in this way, together, these two invariants solve problem two. They are the missing invariant we need to solve problem one. And the the theorem in the AIDS case is in the paper on the archives. You can read about that. I want to talk about the central ideas we use to prove this. There's no, there's no, again, it's just really sad. More general case. The solution depended on the following features. We needed to be able to relate our space X to a section of a universal object. case, u is equal to the sigma t's. The constraints on our universal object have to match the constraints on x. example, the EIDS example, X was always a determinantal singularity. We were not allowing any deformations to X, which left that setting. So this was very easy in this case, because we just took U to be a determinantal singularity, a universal determinantal singularity, that's a curve, but, but it's not so easy as we try to extend these ideas. We want to relate the allowable deformations I should have said infinitesimal deformations here, sorry. We want to relate the allowable infinitesimal deformations of X to the Jacobian module of X In our case, 
This too was easy by the chain rule. F was equal to V composed with B. So the derivative of F was just DG composed with V, not DP. And we see trivially that V star and the Jacobian module of G must contain the Jacobian module of F. But even more was true. In fact, we had the we had good specialization. Here's what I mean by that. You see, we need a if we have a way of associating a module with a family, then we need that if we have the inclusion and we pull back module the level of family, we get the thing that our process produces if we look at x restricted to zero. And this also follows easily from this chain rule description. And then we need a fourth thing. The fourth thing is easy to write down. The section defining X differs from a transfer slice to uh, Whitney's graphication. U only at the origin. Remember, we needed this transversality condition to ensure that the multiplicity of the pair was defined. We're trying to track X in our universal space so that it doesn't change very much if you move it around. Okay. So let's talk about a new setting in which we will try to find these elements. So what I want to talk about today are what I call one CIs. These are complete intersections with a one-dimensional one-dimensional singular set. And throughout this section, I'll be denoting the singular set of that by S of X. So the first thing we need to do is to find a universal object. Well, we do not have a theory of universal objects for non isolated singularities, not a finite dimensional one. But there is a way around that. Anyway, we can think of X 
itself is a family. And it's going to be a family of uh, isolated complete intersections. For isolated complete intersections, we do have a universal family. And we can show that uh, X is induced from that universal family. So that's the thing. So I want to choose a linear function L mapping CN zero to C zero. H is going to be L inverse. H, of course, is a hyperplane. And I want to assume that H is not a limit of tangent hyperplanes. H is not a limit of tangent hyperplanes. Through the strata. And we can assume that after changing coordinates, we can assume that L is equal to zero. That's coordinate. Well, this means that I'm going to get a family of sets over C. L takes this into a family. And then uh, inside here we have the intersection of H with X. Contained in here, and then we also have embedded in here c minus zero, and then we can look at the restriction of L to uh, x minus h intersections, and that embedded in here. We know that if X is part of a Wigney equisingular family, that the, uh, the Whitney type of this Isis must be preserved. We know already that if I just look at this part, I'm going to have a Whitney equisingular family of spaces. A little bit generalized. You have to look at each, if you work along each component of the singular set of, of X, then along that component it becomes the Whitney X singular family of spaces. And that's going to be preserved also if we have X inside of Whitney X singular family. So this is, you don't lose any necessity by doing this. It's okay. Now, since X is a, since X intersect H is an ISIS, and we have a family of ISIS then, and uh, well, this is nicest with uh, versal deformation B. And we have a diagram that X goes down to C. X, of course, is contained now in CN minus 1 cross C because we have that. We have the Zn coordinate. And uh, this maps into C tau, which is the base of our personal unfolding. And we have this map here, which looks like the identity B, where B is the map of the base in C tau. The person definition has defining, has projection 
E of B. And this is contained in Cn minus 1 cross C tau. And basically, we have, we can set this up so that x is equal to, I want to give this a name here. This map here is phi. And x is phi inverse of phi. Uh, of well, it looks like we have found a universal object, but we still have to meet the condition from part two. You see, when we deform x, we want to keep this uh, constant, and we also want to keep the type of the generic fiber here constant as well. And that puts some severe restrictions on what we can use. So we're going to incorporate that in the next step. I want to make a remark here. BV is a stratified map. It's actually a stable map in the sense of matter. But it's also a stratified map with respect to the non boundary stratifications on B and C tau. B is smooth, but so it's only well, has one strap. <laughs> uh, oh, I really want to look at. Yeah. I really want to look at S. S is going to be in the discriminant of P of V, and S parameterizes the generic fiber of L in X. And so what we want to do is we're going to be thinking about restricting everything to S. Because we know that phi will carry C into S. The generic point of C goes to the point that parameterizes the generic fiber of L. And this is basically just phi. Again, it's the same phi. The identity and little phi. Now that we have restricted our situation to S, we have a universal object whose generic fiber is the same as the generic fiber of X surface. So this is really picking up the constraints on X that we want to preserve. Okay, so number three. So I'm going to tell you the construction to reach this third point, that is one where we get through late infinitesimal deformations. And then I'll explain why we do it in a bit. So we want to fix R, a map to uh, Rs going into S, R. And actually, this is a closure here. As far is a resolution it turns out that we we don't need a particular one somehow any resolution works that all comes out of the theory and because phi is a a map from C into S bar, P has a unique lift.
you are. So we get the following uh, diagram here. We have a CN minus 1 cross C, first going down to, well, just down to C, and then it goes over by P to S bar. And then now we have a map into CN minus 1 cross R. This is the projection here. The projection, of course, is just the, the projection is just going to be the identity of the first N minus 1 factor, and it's going to be the, the projection map of the resolution on that last factor. And this map here is going to be gotten by using the identity comma r unique lift p. The key is p. We now have that f is equal to g composed of r r s so r, yeah r this map here is called r f is equal to g composed of r so whoops I'm not quite done yet yeah. So this is a map that lives at this level here, but now we have to compose this. He has right. So this is this is going to be turns out to be true, and then uh, this means that we can use the ideas, use the ideas from the IDS case to relate our Jacobian modules. I needed to get a map that was defining my variety on a smooth space. The problem is that uh, this space here is not smooth, so it's not really clear what the Jacobian module of G might mean. One more point to cover. So this is the generic transversality point. What do we have? We have that V of T is contained in class with V not equal to zero. That's because our, our single set is only one dimensional after all. This then implies that p hat of z t must be transversed to s in c n cross s at b of p hat of s. Right, because in this space, S is the open stratum. It's the open stratum. Transversality to the open stratum in this factor is, is trivial. Actually, this is CN minus one. Sorry. Now it turns out that we unfortunately need another condition, two conditions on our families here for this to work. I'm hoping to uh, 
Pin these down more precisely. Say X is a good family. If there exists some epsilon which works for the whole family, that's about for each Y. There. X of Y intersect B epsilon of zero. S of X B not equal to zero Y. We want to assume that that pair is with me. This is a condition that ensures that the generic fiber of the intersection remains generic long enough. And then the other condition we need is we say that X is admissible if G mapping C cross Y into S R lifts to B hat mapping C cross Y into R. I know that if I have a single space whose single locus is a curve, then it'll automatically get a lift. But we don't know, in fact, you can hear it down counterexamples, that it's not always true that every such family like this lifts to the resolution. But uh, if, for example, the resolution is given by blowing up a single ideal, then in this one dimensional case, it's enough if the multiplicity of that ideal is preserved in the family. And that's got to be. Well, linked to uh, Whitney Echo Singularity anyway, I suspect. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to state the theorem. And then we'll say a little bit why the theorem is true, and that will be the end of the talk. Assume that x d plus k is a good admissible family section as good admissible family section of one. Okay. Then the family is uh, witty and singular if and only if. Well, I have three sets of invariants which I'm going to list. First, I have the Milner number of the singular locus of the, each member of the family at the origin. And I have the multiplicity of the singular locus of each family at the origin. That's my first set of variants. Then I have the generic hyperplane section type. This actually is an invariant in disguise. I'll say why in a second. The 
If we're in a family, we can pin this down using the multiplicity of the Jacobian module, thinking of it as a k plus one parameter family. So this can be described as a word two in a family. Right? And now I need to know that the multiplicity of the ideal defining y times the Jacobian module um, so this is going to be fiber by fiber. I knew that these three sets of invariants are independent of Y. So let me just say very briefly how each of these pieces comes into play here at the end. First condition ensures that the singular set of the total space minus y, y, it is with me. The second condition holds if and only if, if I think of, well, I want to take my family and I'm going to remove uh, y from it. And uh, actually, what I want to do is remove this whole singular. I want to remove the singular locus of the family from it. And I'm looking at it over the singular locus at some point p, p not equal to uh, 0, comma y. Then this has to be written. And how does this work? Because again, we think of, because uh, this is a K plus one parameter family. Over Y cross C. And it's a K plus one parameter family where the multiplicities of the appropriate Jacobian module are independent of Y and C. And so that guarantees that it's a witness gravitation. And uh, the condition on the generic fibers and so now we just have the last point and um, we use condition three to ensure Condition three ensures that uh, that gamma d of the Jacobian module of x is empty. Further, because we're using the ideal defining y, it ensures that all the all the multiplicities are independent of y two and. Now, 
Okay. So with a very, very rough sketch, that's the that's how the thing works. The main thing I want people to think take away from this is the framework that we had, those those uh, four points, a universal object, a universal object has to match the constraints of our of our set that we're working on, and that the we need a good relation between the infinitesimal deformations that are coming from the Jacobian module of our setup to the Jacob, original Jacobian module, and then finally we have to have that transversality condition holding of the uh, Thanks very much, everybody, for your attention. And I wish, uh, as I said, another 16 conferences to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, let, let's see if someone has some question. Uh, I, will, I will wait for uh, for a minute because we, we, we could be we we could have some delay. So. So in the middle of time, I have a question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yaga, what's your question? I don't see the question. I see that Yaga is having a little problem. I think he's back. Okay. Are you, are you back? Are you back? I'm, back. I'm here. I'm back. Yeah. So, uh, Professor, do, do you think it is possible to adapt this kind of invariance for by Lipschitz and singularity by taking the polar varieties of the double of something related to the Jacobian module or something like this? Yeah, that's that's uh, really an interesting question. So, really, what it comes down to is, can we use what we know about the Lipschitz conditions on universal objects. Uh -huh. Something about the Lipschitz conditions on families. And it's likely enough that uh, the families you have will not be as nice as the universal objects. That's like, but we should be able to pinpoint the failure. And that would be an interesting thing. Yeah, I see. I see that. Okay. 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 Good question, but I hadn't thought about it. Oh. Okay. Uh, let's wait for one second. So I think we don't have more questions. So, Professor, thanks again for your very nice talk. And uh, <laughs> I thank the talk one one. Once again, and uh, now we we gonna have a lunch, I think, and uh, we're gonna back to two p.m. So have all a good lunch, and okay. we see. You. Uh, uh, professor, one minute, one minute. Uh, I, I think there is a question from Professor Sidinha here. Can you on the screen? So if you insisted that you only look at weighted homogeneous deformations, well, let's see, maybe that's not true either. Basically, weighted homogeneity means that there is a, there is a group action that, on the singularity. So you want to figure out how to make your constructions reflect that group action. I mean, my underlying philosophy is if you look at your set and look at the allowable deformations, and whatever constraints you have on that need to be reflected in the choice of a universal object. Uh, my guess is that even if you use, for example, if we use the set, setup that I have today, and you're looking at weighted homogeneous singularities, then uh, it would certainly at least make, it should make the computations easier than nothing else. Hmm. 
I think with a better answer would depend exactly if you want more about the kinds of, of families that you were going to allow, what their behavior was along the, that singular curve. Hi, Terry. Chicago is, is over again. Sorry. And uh, we, think, we thank you for your great lecture here to be with us. Thank you for listening to it and thank you for your help. Then. No, it's our pleasure. Sorry for any trouble that we may have caused. And uh, uh, thank you again. It's a pleasure for us to have your name, your lecture here in our program in this 30-year celebration of the International Workshop of Singularities. And uh, thank you. And now uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the the parallel talks of this afternoon. At 2 p.m., we have Klaus Hertling from University of Mannheim. Uh, a quarter to three, Xi Zhang from Fundam University, China, and Stavros Anastasiu from University of Patras, Greece. And uh, we have a pause here and 4 p.m. we have Eder Leandro Sanchez Kiseno from ICMC and Rustan Sadikov from Kansas State University. Here on in the, the website, you click on daily schedule and you have all the links here to click and watch all the, the lectures, okay? So see you tomorrow. By the end of, of the day, you're going to receive again the daily schedule for tomorrow. And we hope to see all of you tomorrow. See you.